extra time. Okay, well, here we go. This is how live works. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Susanna Harris, and you are here for Grad Chat. And if you logged on early, then you got to see what a live video looks like when you kind of mess it up. Um, but luckily, I have an amazing co-host who stands by me even when I do things like this. So, Faye, your turn. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome to Grad Chat. So my name is Faye Lynn. I'm a PhD candidate in biochemistry at UCLA. And this is Grad Chat with me and Susanna Harris for PhD <laughs> Balance. So today our topic is international students and culture. And we're very lucky to have our guest today on Weisha, who is a fifth year PhD candidate at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville at the in the Department of Biochemistry. So Anwisha has lived in southern and western parts of India before moving to Knox Knoxville for a PhD. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the international student experience. And I'm gonna hand it off to Anwisha to say a little bit more about herself and why she's chatting with us on Grad Chat today. Yeah, like, why am I doing this on a weekend, right? I can just go out and do so many different things. But um, yeah, so I'm Anisha, and uh, I actually grew up in a northeastern part of India. It's a very small city called Agartala. And I, yeah, since 2009, after graduating high school, I have lived in western and uh, southern parts of India before moving to Knoxville, USA for a PhD in 2016. Wow. So, you know, like when I, when I was about to move, like when I knew that, oh yeah, oh, I have to go. Like, you know, you apply and everything, you don't really know that you have to make that like flight like that long. And then uh, you have to figure everything out on your own. So yeah, I was pretty nervous when I, uh, thought about it. My parents were very nervous too, but um, I got on the fl plane, you know, like I honestly, I will say that uh, when I was waiting at the airport for my flight to Newark, that was my uh, first flight. And then I had a connecting one. I literally considered, can I just run back? Like, can I just go back? Because it is scary when you are out there and you are seeing that, okay, you're going so far. But anyway, I didn't do that and I'm here today and um, I made it and I'm really glad I came this far and to do my PhD because I think my journey so far has made me um, understand a lot more about myself, explore a lot of things about myself and uh, make good use of the freedom and independence that I got after I came here. Being a PhD student is definitely stressful. I think everybody who is in a PhD watching this will hands-on agree on that. Mm -hmm. On top of that, I think it was, it was stressful. And I think just coming here, there is a huge cultural shock as in, I think the first thing I noticed was like, oh, there are not any, as many humans walking on the streets here. <laughs> so, so that was my first observation. I remember I was just watching the roads and then nobody's walking that much. But uh, back home, you know, we have, we are so many people. So people are walking all the time. And I think one of the key things that first came as a challenge was just managing life. You know, like US, culture here is very individualistic. It's very self-driven. Uh, uh, children and kids, they are they drive their own cars when they're 15 years of age. They have their own license. They have their own freedom. They decide, choose for themselves. They even support themselves through university, right? And that was a huge dif like difference for me because, you know, I was, I was very lucky uh, to have very very amazing parents and I never had to worry about money, you know, funding my college tuition or books or living cost or anything. Like it was all provided for. And I I never had to worry about too much other than studying, I think, uh, mm -hmm. until then. But once I was here, all of a sudden I had to be this 
grad student, who, which already comes with so many facets of responsibility. But on top of that, I was expected to take care of myself, my living space, and arrange a living condition for myself. Mm-hmm. And I never drove. I never, I didn't know how to drive back then. And I had to, I took the bus uh, for three years, actually. And so I had to like, you know, get the schedule down. I had to make sure that I like, you know, I prepared enough so that I can get to the bus because the bus ride can take anywhere between 25 to 40 minutes based on not always traffic, but also, you know, buses uh, accommodate sometimes disabled people. So sometimes if you have passengers who are disabled, it generally takes a long time to like set them up so that they are safely secured. So it's not anybody's fault. It's just how it is. And so, you know, you have to plan for all of these situations. And based on all of that, I was either early or late for class. So, so I had to plan that. I had to make sure I had lunch and I had breakfast and do grocery for that. And also couldn't live like a, like, you know, dirty. So I had to also like, make sure that I'm washing my clothes, doing my laundry. So it was a lot to like deal with personally, I would say, because back home, at least food, like food was always taken care of Mm -hmm. wherever I have lived. I always had options where I could just go and there will be food available. I didn't have this pressure of having food always with me because food's pretty expensive here and especially in universities i have seen that they're not very subsidized so so you know like affording one lunch of chick-fil-a i have to save up and like cook right so mm. so yeah it was very very stressful also the long queues i must mention during the lunch there are two like so many people queuing up and it's always so much time you don't have time to eat so you had to manage all of that and I had never done that before. And so it was a lot. And actually, I ne- I didn't even use a planner back then. So I don't know how I survived. <laughs> um, so I, I think after that, I think in terms of grad school, um, I had to start classes. I had five classes, rotations, and teaching at the same time and had no idea how to teach. And... And, you know, like super nervous about standing in front of all of these people who probably wouldn't even understand how I'm speaking. And it was it was really nerve wracking to like and also education classes. Classes were very different Mm -hmm. because back in India, our classes are not as interactional. When I went through the schooling and uh, university, I think classes here are way more interactive, like student, which I, which is really good. Like I love it now. Um, and, but we were expected to interact, ask questions and back home, that was not how it was. So I could not ask questions. And there were always like extra credits given for asking questions. And I remember just like, like, you know, brooding over one question that I had over and over again, almost not paying attention to the lecture to just like understand if I could manage to ask that question. But as far as I remember, I I couldn't. I couldn't in my first semester. It was too much to like just have the courage and ask. So, So from that point of view to teaching, was like, you know, you you can see the transition there. You were in control and you were in charge of communication. So, so yeah, like it was a lot. It was very, very overwhelming. And actually for that very semester, uh, my department was trying this new system of like trying to start rotations a little early so that that basically uh, students have their home labs as soon as they can. But, but like, they were also trying something new. So like after that semester, I think they also, like now I think grad students, even before, except my batch, they get at least half of the semester to like cope with the classes and everything and then start teaching. So, you know, so you kind of get some time to manage the rest of the stuff 
mm-hmm. before. So, so I was just in that one cohort that was unlucky apparently, but, um, but yeah, I guess I'm here today, so it's okay. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just love that you're bringing up the fact that everyone goes through a transition when they go to grad school, right? But I, I think it's easy for us to uh, forget that not everyone is going through the same journey at all. Um, and that for different folks who are, you know, we've talked about it a lot, Faye and I have talked about it a lot, that grad school is really set up for a specific paradigm, a specific type of person coming from a specific background, even within departments, they assume you've taken certain classes before you get there. Uh, and so if you happen to fit the mold that it's been built for, then fantastic. But uh, if not, I mean, you clearly went through so many things to acclimate to grad school uh, that most people wouldn't even consider. So I wanna make sure that we jump into these questions here. Um, And so one of the questions that came in was this, what was a culture difference that surprised you even if it was small? And so you mentioned having more people on the streets, the really long lines. so I guess other than just it being surprised you, uh, surprising you, did it like throw you off at all? How was that transition to, to switching into a new kind of culture? Yeah, so I think um, I had uh, mentioned it in one of my stories that I think the, uh, the funniest uh, thing that happened to me was that, like, you know, as I said, that choice was not very hardwired in how I'm brought up and how my experience have been so far like before coming to the US because this country has literally taught me what choice is <laughs> like you have a choice for everybody out there so the first day i think in knoxville i had gone to my local uh, store to just get something for the breakfast you know so i had gone and i was like oh i can get some orange juice and and I went to the aisle, like, first of all, navigating was like that cereal aisle and everything, so many choices. And then when I made it to the orange juice aisle, I remember being so confused because they are asking me to decide if I wanted uh, less pulp, more pulp, more vitamin C, less vitamin C, like, and all of the other things. And and I just wanted orange juice. So there was like so much pressure to decide. And I think that was one of the first things when I look back, it's such, it's almost a war, you know, like getting out of the grocery store to just like after you have made the choices. So I think that would be my, one of the smallest changes that really, really shocked me. Certainly nothing that I've, I've thought about before, uh, just not something that, because I'm, I'm, I'm used to it, but it is, it is like, I, I'm just used to walking in and being like, all right, I, I kind of know what I want and like picking between a couple, but I can imagine walking in and just being like, really, this is, this is complicated too. Everything's complicated, but this has to be complicated. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Anisha, I love how you're highlighting these you know, we, we called them like in this question, like what are small things that, that you notice that end up being, if it is adapting to new culture, bigger than small things <laughs> that you end up noticing when you're, when you're adapting to a new place. And I love how you're highlighting how there are day-to-day difficulties, like beyond the whole idea of adjusting to grad school. There's also this idea of taking care of yourself, getting food, getting getting an apartment set up that are all all have its challenges that are different for different people that are also important to talk about that we don't talk about enough as as uh, we adjust to grad school and I think I love these grad chats because we have a space to share how these different challenges are different for different people and especially you know when it comes to I mean like getting food, I think for me, it's also hard to share with people that like, you know, sometimes it's like, it's hard. It's hard to like take care of yourself and like get the food. And then on top of that, you have to adjust to like something seemingly small, like getting orange juice ends up being another point of adjustment. And it's just, it's great to hear different experiences and also have a space to talk about these 
societal small things that end up being a big part of our experience and add up to the overall our overall experiences um so i want to get to another question that we have here it looks like people are curious about teaching as an international student and you kind of talked about this a little bit in your intro but how was it teaching as an international student were there were there certain challenges certain things that that really struck you about teaching yeah i think um my first semester of teaching and uh, we have this like the course I was teaching, they do like a midterm evaluation. And I remember most of my evaluation came back as, uh, you know, that she makes us feel dumb. Uh, she is like, you know, she's very strict and all of that. And I read them and I was very confused because I didn't find myself being like that. You know, it was, it was a very, so I, was, so I asked my coordinator that, hey, uh, do you know why? Like, why would they say that? And then she was like, I don't know, maybe like cultural difference. And then it struck me that, hey, all my, uh, like, you know, everything as uh, my education, you know, all my students, I never was like, you know, nobody cared when they were giving feedback to me about how I was feeling about the feedback. My emotions as a consequence of the feedback that I was receiving was never the focus of the feedback. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what is extremely different in this teaching system because here constantly everybody is urged to pay attention to how the students would feel when you give this particular feedback. And that was a change for me because I was just telling them like, you know, as simple as when we were like, if they were making very small mistakes, like you cannot. So I was just telling them, you know, like I was not sandwiching it. So since then I have learned about the sandwich method where you sandwich the feedback between a good thing and then you put the feedback and then you put another good thing and then it's all taken well and good. So that's basically sugarcoating, right? I was not used to sugarcoating. Nobody in my life ever sugarcoated things for me. They just told me outright, you cried, you cried. You deserve to cry. <laughs> like, it's like that. Like, you didn't know this. You didn't study this. You can't do this. Yeah, that's all you deserve. You deserve to cry. And that is, that's how I, it was not something I intended to do, but that was how I was raised. Mm -hmm. So, after that, I think I had to change my method and reviews were fine. <laughs> so, hmm. so that was a good lesson I got. Yeah, oh, that's, that's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, also those reviews can be brutal. It's amazing how, I love that you brought up the idea of, you know, focusing on emotions. And one of the things that you've brought up before uh, is, is how you've dealt with other ways to learn about yourself, how to deal with emotions, uh, specifically through therapy. And one of the questions we got is, was it difficult to find good therapy as someone from a different culture? How did you find someone or how does a person find someone that can appreciate these different sides? You're not just a grad student, but you're also somebody who moved to a completely new country with a very different culture. How do you find someone somebody who can kind of work with you on all these levels? Yeah, I think, um, I think I didn't go look for a therapist until like, I think the worst thing in my life happened when, so after my second semester, uh, I joined a lab and within two weeks of me joining the lab, my father, my dad got diagnosed with uh, cancer, like malignant, very like, you know, aggressive esophageal carcinoma and I think I think that kind of shook the foundation of me because I'm I'm a very sheltered uh, I grew up very sheltered I spoke to my parents every day and I still speak to my mom every day and if she's watching this she will she freaks out every time I don't talk to her so that's how we are brought up and and just the fact that I will like you know that something so constant to yourself can be affected was 
was out of the world for me. So when that happened, I think everything came like I already had attention issues and everything, but that situation just aggravated everything. So I think I went into depression and I just became extremely like, just, I remember that like I avoided people. I like, I just hid whenever I saw somebody that I knew would talk to me. So I think I went and looked for a therapist when at that kind of a phase Mm -hmm. when, so even though like as a person, like if I didn't have that in my life, I think the therapist that I would look for, like I might, uh, the therapist and myself would get very impatient as we go over this process because it will be difficult for the therapist to kind of gauge, okay, these emotions, family, all these things are so fundamental to this person. Do I understand enough to give her the right feedback? But since I went during a crisis, Mm. so we spoke like as a, I think I had to emphasize more and more how important this was to me because I just couldn't function. Like I, I just couldn't and I was lucky that it took some time. I definitely understand that. And, um, but I was, I think that crisis kind of eased my journey into the therapy uh, because that helped my therapist get to know about me more. Mm. Like, you know, almost in the guise of the crisis. So I think eventually when I, when I was ready to talk about myself and my priorities, she already knew what were the fundamental things that were crucial for me. And I think that that is why I think my journey would have been a little different than mm-hmm. what everybody else's would be. But I will say this though, that I have since encouraged a lot of my international friends to go take therapy. And, you know, therapists make a living out of helping people. So if they don't understand you right away, they work hard and they really try. So just being an international, I like, I think I know can be a deterring factor for going and asking for therapy. But I assure you again and again that any therapist who is committed to doing his or her job well will always try to help you like first session second session that motivation won't change you know and that makes a whole world of difference Mm. yeah Uh, that's that's so true Uh, just uh, and it's really cool to hear that you encourage others um, to seek that treatment, right? Is that there can be a barrier depending on different cultures about about seeking therapy and there's certainly different kinds of stigmas. And, and I, I love that you are speaking from a very personal space and that you're willing to share these stories with people because, you know, there's, there's so many people out there who need to hear that message. Yeah, and I think uh, something important in that uh, topic as well is that while I was going through therapy and going through all of this hell where I could not be the grad student that was expected of me, I was functioning at a very low capacity. So, you know, I was constantly disappointed in myself. So, you know how you start the self-sabotage vicious cycle where you loathe, then you again feel guilty, then you loathe again, and then that keeps going. And I think therapy helped me sometimes recognize And I lost my dad like within 10 months of his diagnosis. And you can imagine leading, just living through, I was not there for my dad when he was going through chemotherapy. And, but I, but you know, like mentally I was there. I would have liked to be there physically, but but that's another topic of another set of circumstances why I couldn't be there. But at the same time, Mentally, I was incapable of being at that place. And I would just start my day with talking about chemotherapy and side effects and end my day and somehow make it through the day so that I'm strong for my parents. You know, like it's important for my parents to know that I'm doing well 
in education what they have worked for all their life. So a part of me was like, if I could stay here and give this illusion that, oh, I was in grad school, like, yes, you are suffering and I know I feel for you, but I'm going through grad school. I was really not, but I think that illusion helped my dad not feel guilty when he was already so sick. Mm -hmm. But that made me sacrifice my time with my dad. And that can, that will be always the top regret of my life. And mm -hmm. I, I know that I can't help it, but, but you see how the system has set me up for that, right? Like always told me I had to be successful. Education was first. And then I had to choose between the two fundamental things in my life. That was family and education. Mm -hmm. and, and you know what? Nobody teaches you to do that. Nobody teaches you what you should do then. And, and why I'm saying this is because when I came back, therapy helped me a great deal at that point. And this is important because it highlights that you, therapy or psychiatric help is not only when you are in crisis. Psychiatric help and therapy, professional help is always there and is required and is recommended for a healthy mental wellness you know like mental wellness physical well-being are interconnected and it's the best when you have mental health taken care of mm -hmm. so you know when you hit a crisis you're already in a crisis you're freaking out if you go look for sources and professional help then chances are it will be way more harder for you because trust me it's not so easy to find professional help the kind that you will like so mm -hmm. it is always wise to have professional help like lined up for you so that if you have a crisis that hits you because life is like that it's gonna it's going to throw challenges after challenges at whatever pace it likes to and you have no control over that but you have control over your own self care and that is ensuring that you have you have primary physicians right so why not have primary psycho psychologists have therapists that are always there so that you can turn to them when you really need it, but not when only crisis hits. Yeah, I mean, it just, I mean, it sounds like you've learned so much and, and that, that piece about no one teaches you these things. Um, yeah, I, I think it's so important for you to, to be talking about, about this. Um, because that's the only way that people can can figure it out, right? Yeah, I love how you brought so many layers together about navigating mental health. I think one key thing that resonated with me was that there are societal pressure or expectations. For example, you mentioned this, this pressure in academics, but also this this, um, I guess, family responsibility and also like emotionally needing or, or really wanting to be there during this time of, during this tough time for your family. And I think that that is such an important topic where when talking about mental health, there are a lot of societal constructs if it's stigma or if it's a lot of pressure to focus on our education that really impact whether or not we engage with that mental health journey or just a lot of barriers or complexity that make us question how to approach our overall wellness that is enforced upon society. And I think that is, it is so important to have open dialogue about that and to explore the complexities of how there are, you know, there are societal pressures that we have to reflect on how they affect us and how you know, how it's important to still maintain our mental health despite stigma and despite other things that society might, might throw challenges at. And let's see, we do have a couple more questions that I, that I wanna get to before we end our grad chat today. And one of them says, how do you maintain work-life balance? It's Which very, is sort of funny on a Saturday, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So um, first, um, I was telling Susanna yesterday about how much I have, how much content I have inside me that's like bottled up, wanting to like, you know, sprout because I hope you can tell that I have, I have done a lot of thinking about my situation and the things that I've gone through. And the reason that I'm here today is because I didn't have the resources and some, and you know, the right help that probably I needed a graduate student, somebody who went through the same process. But I want to make sure that the next person has that. So, yeah, so I know that I won't be able to share everything today, but uh, hopefully we'll come back at some other point to finish yeah. everything. But, um, but yeah, but okay. So going back to work-life balance, it's, I think it's a very personal thing. Work-life balance is as personal, personalized as you want it to be. I think for everyone, you cannot force somebody to take personal life breaks if they don't want to, right? So first, you have to evaluate that, that for yourself. You have to ask yourself, and it does, it's not going to happen overnight. You're going to have to keep asking yourself, how much of a profession, how much of a personal life and work balance that do you want? Because you can cater it according to your needs. Because honestly, it's all about time management. I know that, like, you know, it seems like, oh, yeah, no, you're joking. Yeah, I think I'm joking too, but I think the key is time management that if you really can be a person who can work within time blocks, which is a myth for me, because I always, always underestimate how much time I'm going to take to do a certain thing. And with experiments, it's trickier because experiments never go like the way you want them to be. So it always end, end up like, you always end up taking more than the time that you allotted for it. but if you keep trying and trying to be within those boundaries that you allot to yourself and nobody else is allotting, work-life balance can evolve, can evolve with however like seasoned you get with practicing it. And I think that's it. I think that would be the key. Just because you take uh, breaks to cater to your personal life does not equate your success as an academic role in any kind of academic role that you are you can be as successful of a professor if you take care of your family as well like there is no nothing that i know i i've met a ton of people who told me you can either have a good phd or have a good life and i don't i think it's true for maybe some people i think we don't have a good life. I don't, I, because I just can't manage time as well. If, if I started using planner after my therapist suggested that to me, I, nobody told me about using planners. So it's all about introducing these tools that can help you manage your life better. Because you know, the other person, like I struggle with attention issues so bad that planner is like in like you know something that is indispensable for me right now like i need it but somebody might be able to function as well by just keeping a head list right my mom just retired last month she never had a planner uh, she had 36 years of job so she did her job so it works from like you know expectations evolve with time so i think our last generation did not need that and our generation where expectations are so high, we are so expected for instant uh, comfort and satisfaction and so technology oriented, you need to also introduce tools that will help people. And I think that is something that I hope will be introduced to, to kids in school so that when they reach PhD, that is not a roadblock at all. We are struggling because we were unlucky and we have to learn it right now. And it's hard. Absolutely. And before um, before we let you go, and I love the idea of you coming back. I would absolutely love that. You just have, from our discussions alone, you have so much to say. And like you said, you've, you've clearly been thinking about this. Um, but before you go, is there anything else you want to tell the audience? And I want to say too, we have 
we have a bunch of comments in uh, in the chat going on, which is awesome. One that I do see though is uh, I don't know if this name is familiar to you, but it's uh, Maha Suita Dasgupta, and that's, says yeah, that's my cool. aunt. <laughs> that's really cool. I w I wondered if there was some sort of relationship, but. Um, yeah, like you were saying, the importance of family. But is there anything else that you want to make sure that people can take away from, from this talk today? Uh, yeah, I think um, especially uh, coming to U.S., I realized how education and age are not correlated. Uh, you like, you know, I in my cohort, there were people of different ages and they're free to come pursue PhD. Mm -hmm. And that is very uncommon back home. And in all the internationals that are here, I know how different challenges are owing to what, like, you know, if you have, have done a PhD, if you are doing one, and if you will be doing one. I just, uh, I just ask one thing of everybody that take a step, think if you really want to do this, because this is a commitment and nobody's happy with doing things in a half committed manner. People mm -hmm. I, who I know loves to work hard, loves their job, always want to do things in full commitment. So this is a full commitment. Make sure you really want it and come into it thinking that that's not going to be just your life. Mm -hmm. Give as much time, practice trying to give as much time for your hobbies and cooking and self-care and talking to doing whatever that, that makes you happy. Do not eliminate that from your life. Your happiness is not worth anything else in this. Like, you know, it's the topmost priority. And if you are happy, you're going to do wonders in whatever branch of life that you want to. But I just like, you know, the, that would be the end message that always evaluate your happiness, like do a happiness quotient or something. And don't let that waver after you join grad school. Mm -hmm. If you do see that it's wavering, raise your voice, talk to people because it shouldn't. We all are here because we love doing what we do and it shouldn't make us sad for that. I can't think of a better way to end the show. Uh, <laughs> that's just really beautiful. Well, um, Faye, I'll let you take us out uh, as per usual. I just wanna stay and chat. The entire time. But yeah, on we should, we're gonna bring you back because just God, I I just want to put you on your own show and just let you just just speak. But um yeah, so thank you so much for, for being here. Yeah, it's yeah, thank you so pleasure. much for being here. This is this has been Grad Chat from PhD Balance. We go live every Saturday, 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, and Join us next time where we, Suzanne and I, bring on new guests, talk about new topics, that topics that are harder to talk about day to day that we chat with amazing guests about. So until next time. Awesome. All right. Bye, everybody. Okay. I think.